Um, the objectives of the talk is to give you a basic knowledge of enterprise application integration patterns, um, show you a little bit about the how to implement these, and um, number three is the benefits and shortcomings of enterprise application integration patterns in the cloud. So as I said, welcome everybody. My name is Alexander Heusingfeld. <clears throat> I work as a senior consultant for software development at CyberCon uh, in Germany. Um, and also doing freelance consulting and uh, workshops mainly in the um, area of enterprise application integration. Yeah, my name is, um, my name is uh, Stefan Reuter and I work as a freelancing software architect uh, also in Germany, um, mainly doing business in the finance and logistics uh, industry. Um, during our consulting jobs, we often have uh, concerns about enterprise application integration. Um, and uh, when we go to our customers, they say, of course we're doing enterprise application integration as we got a SOA product or a business process modeling and, uh, or an ESB. But actually, nobody really concerned looking at the whole space of enterprise application integration. So. Um, our target when doing the proposal was handling the bus around enterprise application integration, getting you on track, what actually is enterprise application integration and how you can benefit from uh, the many, the many um, software projects out there. Yeah, and the patterns actually provide you with an option to um, just put in some structure into that uh, fuzzy thing uh, that uh, uh, is that enterprise integ application integration is about. So you probably heard lots of words, lot of, lots of concepts um, uh, defined differently by different vendors and uh, the, the patterns um, will actually provide you a kind of structure that allows you to make sense of that and also compare uh, the approaches of uh, several vendors or several stacks. To not drift into theory too much and uh, to keep up strong connection to practice, we chose a real life example of one of our customers. It's a logistics service provider um, who integrates many uh, business partner systems with his own system. Um, and we're, we're actually uh, referring to this um, demo, this, this real life scenario, uh, often in the, in the process of this uh, presentation because um, most of the, of the common concerns when uh, dealing with enterprise application integration are built into this scenario. So um, actually uh, what I wanted to say is the application is uh, running for five years now in production. Uh, we got um, in there about three years ago when they had um, uh, concerns about uh, performance and um, I have to say this application is running about two and a half years um, now based on enterprise integration patterns using Spring Integration. So to get started, um, most people read the Wikipedia entry on uh, the definition of enterprise application integration. Um, it basically, uh, basically says that enterprise application is a way to connect a set of enterprise computer applications. Um, well, this is actually quite intro, so um, if you're going to find out about enterprise application integration at all, the Wikipedia entry is a good starting point. Um, the set of computer applications um, is very often also called um, information silos, right? Um, like a big uh, ERP systems like SAP, my ERP or something, or a customer relationship management like uh, Siebel, for example. <clears throat> Yeah, and inter enterprise application in that sense also means that you get a complete stack because usually you have a vendor uh, who sells you a CRM system or who sells you an, an ERP system and you get um, all their interpretation of um, uh, what to use for integration, of what to use as a database. And so you come up with uh, two totally different stacks that now you have to integrate. In basic, you can, uh, you can uh, divide enterprise and application integration into uh, two common parts. It's actually linking information silos via mediation, meaning explicitly connecting um, 
two or more applications by adopting their interfaces and transform data between them. Right? It's actually if you say I need to connect my CRM system to the ERP system explicitly, that is mediation. The other form will be federation. And um, federation actually is providing access for external applications like um, you build a common API around this so um, the, the external application doesn't have to uh, uh, doesn't have to adopt the, um, the API of your CRM and your ERP but um, has a common API to integrate. Yeah, so if you're using um, like customer integration um, with two systems, then using federation would mean that by providing an external API, you would just um, update both systems transparently to the user. And by using mediation, it would mean that the two systems would somehow talk to each other to replicate the data. So you would update it in one system uh, that is leading the data, and then it would be replicated to the other system. And which one you choose? Um, actually depends on a lot of uh, factors. Usually uh, you will just use a mix uh, for different use cases. A different mix is actually what we chose for our real life scenario. As you can see, um, we have the, uh, the federation used as uh, providing a REST service for um, the external business partner system. And we also use mediation to uh, integrate the order management system of the logistic service provider with uh, the system of the forwarder. So to summarize it um, again, Lincoln information silos via mediation or federation is enterprise application integration. And to quote Martin Fowler on that, um, who uh, with others wrote a book in 2003, um, Various technologies have been around for enterprise application integration and actually the asynchronous messaging is really the best practice to do it. So is there actually a real life example of enterprise application integration with uh, let's say asynchronous messaging? Well yeah, obviously um, if you imagine a reliable postal service as um, Every application has uh, its main uh, mailbox. Um, just to give you a short idea about uh, what the benefits of, of using messaging is, um, well, if you if you uh, change your infrastructure to asynchronous messaging, you uh, receive a, a couple of benefits. Like, uh, first of all, uh, message-based um, communication allows decoupling. And not only decoupling of applications, but also decoupling of components or even services. Yeah? You can draw this as deep as you like and uh, decouple um, whatever kind you need. And decoupling also um, gives, uh, gives great benefits in scaling. If you uh, think of, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, if you think of, um, you, you divide your, uh, your processes into small steps and decouple these so they don't know about each other, you can easily scale one of these steps, right, where you're going back to that, uh, right, in, in a few minutes. Um, so another thing I'd like to point out here is uh, variable timing and throttling, um, meaning that through the asynchronous messaging, you can really uh, let every application work at its pace. You know that means uh, you don't have to have to um, uh, spend a lot of effort to um, increase performance on, on some applications. You uh, just can scale them up, or uh, yeah, do uh, do a little throttling, and you're very flexible on this point. Yeah, usually um, this uh, timing and throttling comes into use when you have uh, systems that have different characteristics uh, regarding how many load they can handle. So, for example, if you have a banking application where you have a quite performant front end for end users to do do banking stuff with, um, and a rather rather slow back end system um, that does all the, the the data management and the accounting. Then usually it um, you need some some kind of um, mechanism in place to 
um, protect the backend system from um, the uh, front end system. So if you have lots of users in the front end system, you don't want them to uh, bring your back end system down or to uh, lead to um, performance degradation there. So by using messaging, you can just um, limit the rate of messages that are sent to the backend system and so to actually slow down the front end system and the users maybe even to um, refuse service to some of them and just show them a message um, try again later or something like that just to protect the backend system and that that's what uh, comes uh, for free when using messaging because you have those messages in the message stream and you can just um, apply your policies there so next item is um, reliable communication. Um, this is also very important because um, if you're using something like HTTP or in, in the REST world for um, actually connecting systems, then you have to make sure within your application um, that the messages or that the data and the, the function calls are actually um, delivered to the system. If the system is not there, if you receive an error, error or whatever, or the network is down, then you um, have to retry it um, uh, until the system actually accepts it. With messaging, it's quite different because you just fire and forget the message, and the infrastructure takes care to re-deliver or um, to deliver when the system comes back into operation. Okay, um, when thinking about patterns, you um, first of all think about the Design Patterns book by Eric Gamma. Um, just give me a little hands up, who knows about the book? Who read it? <laughs> who used it? Okay, it's getting less and less, okay. Um, okay, but the, the, the interesting thing is that I bet that most of you, even if you didn't uh, raise your hands now um, for having used it, have used patterns even if you didn't read the book, if you di didn't know about it, because it's so prevalent um, that um, even uh, many classes within the JDK or um, in many frameworks are actually um, built across, uh, built around those patterns. So this is the same with the enterprise integration patterns. Um, even if you don't know about them, even if you haven't uh, actually applied them, then you probably have used some kind of products or some kind of software that actually applies them. Right. Um, Enterprise Integration Patterns is a book by uh, Gregor Hoppe and Bobby Wolf. It's um, definitely the reference on uh, uh, patterns in, in terms of asynchronous messaging. And um, some also call it the Bible of uh, a, a EAI. Um, so if you haven't read this or uh, bought you a copy, I can really advise you to, to do this because um, it's also uh, it's not only a great lecture but also, as I said, a reference to, to look up certain things. Yeah, and the and common uh, structure and naming convention. So if you're talking to other people about concepts in the enterprise integration um, world, then uh, just using the names of the patterns in the um, uh, in the patterns book um, helps you um, communicate with different groups with per people with different um, backgrounds because it's just one concept and one name. Right, and actually the uh, names in the book um, are also widely spread across the mediation frameworks we're going to talk about now as. Um, uh, it's good for the theory, but how to use enterprise application integration patterns, for example, in your Java EE application. Well, actually, there are multiple approaches. Um, first of all, you can do it yourself by leveraging uh, APIs like uh, JMS um, or JaxRS. But um, a word on do it yourself is know when to stop. When things get in too complex, then maintenance gets too complex and there's always a person coming right after you who has to understand what you did. And that's when actually you should use a mediation framework like Apache Camel or Spring Integration. They provide um, a great collection of uh, implementations for uh, certain patterns um, referenced from the book of Enterprise Application Integration Patterns. 
and um, they make it completely easy to integrate applications no matter what size. Yeah, and you can actually um, make use of them um, if you're only using very small parts of this. So if you only have to integrate with, say, one or two systems, then you can just make use of, a, of such a framework and use it um, not as a main structure for your application, but just use it instead of um, plain HTTP calls or something like that. So we'll show you an example later on um, how to actually integrate in your application. and. Um, uh, so you will benefit from this um, very early on. Yeah, to provide you with some of the names of the common AI patterns, uh, we just chose uh, chose some uh, which we want to introduce to you. First of all, uh, a definite um, lecture for everyone is adapters. Adapters' main purpose is actually to turn custom data into message. And then we have pipes and filters, also common herd uh, common herd uh, pattern. We have the router, which is really commonly used, a splitter and an aggregator. That's, from our point of view, the main components, the main patterns you should know about. Um, there's also reference on the, on the slides, which we'll, we'll provide the link later, um, into the Enterprise Application Integration Patterns book, which also has a website. You can read on it about more patterns if you like. And I, could, I would really give you the advice to have a look at this website, it's great. <clears throat> so um, with all, um, with all the, the samples, uh, we try to stay in our real life scenario, meaning uh, we chose the domain model of this logistic service provider and we speak of orders in terms of a purchase order, we speak of a logistics system or a forwarder system and um, we speak of um, uh, order items like uh, you, you choose a picking item in the warehouse or something. That's our domain model for the uh, upcoming samples. Okay, so let's uh, start with the adapters. Um, we have uh, inbound adapters and outbound adapters. So depending on where the data is actually leaving your system or is entering your system. And with every application, um, you have a specific interface um, that um, is basically twofold. So on the one hand, you have the data that is uh, coming in that defines what is inside the message, what is inside the payload. And you have um, uh, different uh, channels or transports through which you can accept the data. And the adapters are basically um, about the transport. So you have one adapter per transport that you're uh, using to either receive or send out data. Um, so one example is um, using FTP. And you have an FTP inbound adapter if you're receiving files through FTP or an FTP outbound adapter if you're sending files through FTP. Um, other examples here are the, the forwarder system. So they have a, a SOAP uh, interface, web service interface, secured with uh, WSSE, so that you can track data there. That's um, uh, their system. So the forwarder system would have an inbound uh, adapter for that SOAP stuff and um, the logistics system would have an outbound adapter to actually call it. Um, other examples are the forwarder system that sends the email notifications. So this is just an outbound adapter and there won't even be a corresponding inbound adapter somewhere because the emails are for, for human beings so they will just receive it on their email client. Okay, to give you a visual reference, a representation of this pattern, uh, we chose uh, the diagram, which is also uh, published on the Enterprise and Application Integration Patterns website. Um, you can actually see that the main purpose, as I said, of the channel adapter is to adopt the application's interface and create a message which can then be sent through a message channel. Right? That's actually the main purpose. And to keep uh, things simple, it shouldn't do more. Right? It shouldn't do like, let's say, adapt the interface and do a transformation. That's a special step, it's just an adapter. Hmm. 
The next scenario would be pipes and filters. As you said, uh, saw, uh, saw the message channel. This is actually called a pipe. Like um, uh, you know from, from Unix, you can pipe the output of different commands um, uh, to, to the next command using the pipe, uh, the pipe command, right? Um, this is actually the same pattern here. Um, pipes and filters are used uh, to decouple the processing, um, meaning you have a seemingly complex scenario like that one here and decouple it and, and uh, divide it into simple steps so it becomes that simple that it's really to, to get into that at the first look. Yeah. We, had, um, we here had the, um, the, the, the purpose um, of an incoming purchase order uh, to the system and um, our logistic, logistic service provider needed to check whether um, the, uh, the message was encrypted correctly. Uh, he wanted to know whether it's a known customer, meaning uh, the customer was authenticated, um, provide correct authentication. And um, he also wanted to make sure that the incoming message isn't a duplicate of another order he already received. And to visualize these steps, we actually um, provided three different filters, like the decryption, the authentication, and a DDoP. None of these filters knows about each other. You could easily switch them around to have a different order, like uh, first of all, authenticate and then decrypt, or something like this, if the uh, authentication information is uh, somewhat in, in the header or something. Um, that's, that's what I said about decoupling. You could easily uh, tune in to uh, some different step here. It's no problem at all. It's simple. You can easily get this, what, what it means at the first uh, glance when you see it. <coughs> so to, um, to summarize it, actually decoupling means, in our point of view, easier maintenance, reusability and exchangeability of the different steps you use. Yeah. Okay. The, the question the, was, um, and what these these pipes are about? So whether they are about uh, whether they are like uh, JMS queues or something like that. And actually, um, the name pipes and filters is is quite abstract for a reason. So um, using JMS queues there would be one option, um, but not the only one. That really depends on your requirements. Um, so if you have a, fil uh, a pi um, uh, pipes and filters uh, uh, snippet like this uh, that we have there, then using JMS queues would be a, a bit heavyweight because you would um, just grab the message from JMS, decrypt it, and write it back. So in that uh, case, you would use um, single, uh, simple in-memory pipes so that these things are just connected, but it's a matter of um, configuration to just switch that to using JMS queues. Um, and um, you can use quite a lot of different implementations for these pipes. So these non-functional um, properties that are talked about, like throttling, they can also be applied to those pipes, or even a delay. So you can say, okay, I want to have a delay that has an additional property to just delay the messages by, say, 10 minutes or so. Yes. So you can use this in just one JVM, um, or you can use it distributed, then you would have to use uh, JMS queues. Yeah. Yeah, well, one thing um, regarding the, the, the decoupling, um, of course you have it decoupled when you deploy it and when you build it, but you can also very easily test it because you can actually use them in isolation. So you can have just one of these filters, like the decrypt thing, and write a unit test for all possible um, input that, that can be accepted. And then you have um, one of these filters available on your, uh, on your toolbox that you can use to build applications later on. The um, question was whether this is a product. So um, no, it's not a product. It's basically a concept, but it's implemented by different products. One of them being Apache Camel, the other Spring Integration, and uh, more and more of the commercial EAI things also um, have a look at the patterns and uh, use that uh, to provide uh, those bricks.
Uh, the question was, uh, if this is like an ESB, yes, but the ESB is just one implementation um, of this, and um, usually you cannot right, integrate it within your own applications. So that's the basic difference. The thing is um, about the mediation frameworks, they are really lightweight. Yes, um, If you have an ESB, a fully blown enterprise service bus, it's, it's a separate application. Uh, you can use these patterns inside of your application, right, to, to decouple your programming logic. And um, that's actually the main benefit. You don't have to use a separate uh, product, um, which, which has to be bought first of all, but um, you can do a very lightweight uh, decoupling by using this mediation framework in terms of uh, development. Right, you could, as I said, um, decouple services inside your application. It doesn't depend on whether it's uh, the same application, the same JVM. You can do whatever you like. It's, this is just a concept and the implementation of the mediation framework gives you totally freedom how you would like to, uh, to integrate it into your job. Okay, so best thing, I guess, uh, to just see how it works is to have a look at a short demo. Then you'll also see uh, the difference between using it within your application or using a separate product separately deployed like in the ESP. All right, to uh, give you a short insight how um, Spring Integration uh, works with this, um, we uh, decided to do a gateway sample. A gateway is basically um, an adapter uh, which also receives data back but it's part of your application. So uh, most, most of our customers have the fear, well, um, if I use a Spring Integration um, gateway, uh, my application is tightly coupled to Spring Integration. And that's actually what we wanted to show you, that it's not. And um, actually with Apache Camel, it's basically the same. So just have to get the sample over there. It's an 800 by 600 resolution. So, so, just to have a look at the example, let in the, the namespace definition uh, just at the top of the page. This is our complete example, right? Um, you have a definition of, these, of this gateway. So um, first of all, Spring Integration provides a known namespace for uh, your configuration of these, um, uh, of, the, of the routes, so-called. Um, some call it a Spring Integration Flow. In Apache Camel, it's uh, called a root. Uh, so what you call it is actually um, based, uh, your belief left to you. Um, it starts with, these, uh, with, the, with the gateway. Um, which says, well, um, the gateway is actually of a type of a service interface, really meaning a Java interface. We see this in, in the sample in a minute. Um, it says, um, by default, go to uh, send my message, send my data to this channel, and receive data back on this <laughs> channel. Um, the sample actually says, well, um, I need to get some data in, and um, if everything is fine, the data goes through, then I don't want to see it again, but um, if it's blocked by a filter, you remember the filter pattern, um, then I want to get my message back. Yeah, that's uh, the non-matching ma matching message channel. Um, and this is simply what the, what the filter does. So um, you go from this channel right over here to the channel definition. It's the input channel for this filter. And the filter says, well, um, if everything goes fine and the expression matches, send it to the output channel, the message, send the message to the output channel. If not, disc uh, discard the message and send it to the non-matching message channel. Um, to not uh, confuse you uh, too much, um, the demo uh, uses an expression-based filter. It's simply a spring expression language, uh, which just uh, looks, um, is the, is there a payload in the message, which does the question mark here, 
and does it contain the word sample context, uh, content? So um, if it doesn't, uh, it's sent to the non-matching message channel. Um, if it does, it's sent to the matching message channel. And that's actually all you need to do. You, can, uh, you could easily provide your own filter, your custom filter. You could uh, use like XPath filter. You could whatever it, it is really. Um, Spring integration has many implementations for a common filter and common, common based things. You really want to, want to try out this. Um, there's a documentation link already um, in our presentation. So if you choose to use this, go with the documentation and um, actually you can, uh, can also uh, ask questions to us, to the Spring integration guys, same with the camel guys. Yeah, and what you can see here, what you can see there is um, that you're actually mixing things that are provided by the framework that are available out of the box like the filter with the expression um, and things that you wrote on your own, like the output adapter down there where you just put in the name of a class and a method and then this is called by the framework. So this is usually how it works. You get a lot of um, filters and adapters and gateways um, from the framework that you can use right away, like um, for all common protocols and stuff. Um, or transformation like uh, access L transformations and stuff like that. Um, th th that's for free basically, it's well tested and you can use it. But if you have any special needs, um, any special system that needs um, for data in a special format or that has a special transport, then you can um, build your own implementation of that and just hook it into the framework. And uh, for you to see that the framework isn't in your way, I'd actually uh, open this class. It's a, it's a, a really simple bean. And with the uh, configuration here, you say um, use the bean my external system adapter and call the send data method. And if you just uh, go into this class, you see it actually does plain nothing. So your, um, your uh, application code, your business logic could be here. It's just a, a simple system out to show you that Spring integration doesn't actually get in your way at all. So use a mediation framework, whatever, and I really advise you to, uh, to use this kind of pattern with each implementation because um, actually you don't want to depend on, on the messaging framework, right? Your application should be decoupled from this. And to show you, um, Actually, the, um, the, the call of the uh, gateway, <coughs> we wrote a simple test. Um, uh, actually, two tests. Um, you get this, uh, you get the uh, interface, the um, implementation of the interface um, through a dependency injection. So if we have a look at the custom gateway, it's really a plain Java interface. There's nothing in it except for the method declaration. And you just say, well, or give me an instance of it. And a Spring integration creates a proxy for you, um, which actually has the configuration you saw in the XML file. And you can use it like this. Simply send whatever string you want to, to put there, and it takes care of it for you. Right, and you get back the string can do uh, assertions, can, can use it in your further business logic, it doesn't really get in your way. Um, all the code you hear, see here, we'll provide later a link to GitHub where you can download the samples and have a look at this. Okay, so um, next pattern we want to have a look at is a message router. That's actually a, a kind of a conditional thing where you can um, uh, use whatever expression or uh, the feature of a message um, to decide uh, which way to go. So one example is a product type that we're using in our logistics application um, so that you can um, uh, make a difference based on that or based on the, on the payment method. If it's a credit card, then use uh, one direction. And if it's a direct debit, then use another provider. Um, stuff like that, just conditional logic. Um, 
yeah. that's what it looks like in the in the pictures. Those um, uh, pictures and those icons are also part of the book, so that that gives you one um, a visual representation that is the same across all all vendors and across all uh, implementations of those um, those patterns. And as you see, you have an a uh, message that is coming through a, a filter, right? In the example, you have a queue. Uh, could be any channel, any pipeline. Um, then you have a message router that um, decides where to put the message, and it either goes out into out Q1 or out Q2, depending on, on the logic. Important thing is here that um, the uh, patterns um, put a strong focus on um, having one responsibility per filter. So you have a message router, then the only thing that the message router does is to decide which way to go. Um, there is no transformation of the message, there's nothing else happens, so you have the same message that you had in Q1 uh, after the router, either in out Q1 or in out Q2. Um, and um, of course, um, the logic can be quite uh, expensive, depending on, on what you're doing there. It may involve external data or whatever, but um, the message router just has this uh, single responsibility. So the transformer, as you know, my from the word, transforms data. It's its single purpose just to um, adopt data model from one application and turn it into the data model of something else. Um, in our example, um, if you need to, to get customer data from the ERP system to the CRM, um, we had a different data model in both applications, meaning the fields had different semantics, like um, there, there wasn't a first name and a last name field in the uh, ERP system, so we had to uh, combine it uh, when we, got, when we uh, turned uh, data from the CRM to the ERP and uh, things like that. And, uh, actually, um, the, the diagram we're going to show you seems quite complex, but if you, if you think of it really does only transformation, <laughs> have, a look, have a second look at it and uh, find out what it does. I think definitely at the second glance you know what it does. It simply gets its configuration data from a metadata repository, meaning whatever repository, database or something like a service. Um, so it's a great example of what you can actually do with these patterns, right? The implementation depends on you, depends on the framework, whatever you want to do with it, but it simply does nothing more than translation of the data you gave it. The other steps from uh, whether be, uh, before this or coming after this don't know nothing about translation and they don't care because it's not their purpose. Yeah, and again there you also have a, a quite a um, large set of uh, pre-built transformers. So I already told you about uh, XSL transformation and stuff like that. Or to convert an object to a JSON uh, representation or all those things that can be done um, once and then configured, um, they're usually part of the frameworks. So um, uh, that uh, often you can go away without implementing your own transformer, but just using one and configuring it uh, so that it does what you want. Another pattern commonly used is uh, definitely the splitter. In our example, it uh, uh, splits a CSV file um, to uh, process each line separately. And you're gonna see an uh, example of this in about a minute. Um, it's really, really commonly used. It does nothing more than just um, take, the, take the expression you configured and split the message by this expression, right? You know this all from your programming language. This is the way, uh, this is the pattern to choose in your uh, uh, mediation framework, meaning your uh, integration. Right, and this, um, you got the, the order item, um, which, which is in, uh, actually in order position. Other purchase order, think about, um, you got different, uh, different items, physical or non-physical, like a service or something, and you wanna process them separately. That's the way to go. 
Yeah, and as we are in a mess <clears throat> in a messaging world, um, that means that you just have these um, three or however uh, how, how much ever um, items uh, you get, and they are just new separate messages that will be processed asynchronously and in parallel. So um, now you can um, have uh, one order with uh, all those items in there. You split it. You process them in parallel, and. Um, then you have to um, get them back and um, aggregate them back into one uh, message uh, that you can finally return. Um, and that's the next pattern, that's actually the aggregator um, that is used to collect all uh, messages that belong together and um, put them back into one message. <coughs> that's usually done by um, having some kind of header or uh, whatever the messaging system uses to identify uh, the messages that belong to the same original message. Yeah. If you think of uh, in terms of our domain model, um, if you have an order position, it certainly has a reference to the uh, or a number to the order it uh, it belongs to. And that is uh, actually the example here. Um, if you have an inventory item, you combine this uh, into an inventory order, so you have. Um, a completed order state uh, across all the uh, different items in your order. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so that leads us uh, to our next demo uh, where we'll uh, show you how to deal with um, uh, this uh, CSV files uh, that are then split and aggregated finally. Um, it's of course a, a further more complex um, scenario, so um, the configuration is um, much more detailed, but uh, try to document, uh, document it so everyone gets it. Actually, uh, that's the uh, version coming right uh, out of the Git repository, so um, the documentation is in there. So even the, uh, the developers of the logistics service provider really know what the heck this thing is doing there. <laughs> Um, so let me get into there. Um, the scenario is you, you get a, a CSV file and uh, this can be, uh, this can contain uh, different types of data, meaning um, you have uh, a directory uh, where there are separate uh, CSV files, uh, one for let's say services of a warehouse like um, uh, restructuring your, uh, your locations of the, um, of the, of the products and uh, the pickings when you uh, send an order out, right? Um, these are different, uh, different files and you have to identify them if they, if they go into the same directory. And that is basically what we do here. We um, define the known headers um, to just import the correct data. So we go here um, with an inbound <coughs> file adapter Meaning, um, this is an implementation of um, Spring integration to actually watch one uh, folder on your file system and uh, you can configure it to actually import all files or just files matching a certain pattern. Um, in this case, um, we said, well, um, if this directory doesn't exist yet, uh, please create it. And uh, the pre uh, prevent duplicates feature is um, a feature of uh, Spring integration where it actually recognizes file names it already imported. So if the same file goes in another time, it won't import it again. <clears throat> then we have configured a poller, meaning um, the directory gets polled every 10,000 milliseconds. So um, when the file is going uh, gone imported, uh, it's Inside, it gets inside the uh, incoming ABR file channel and is then forwarded to a file to string transformer. That's a common implementation of Spring integration, meaning you have a, a file input stream and need to transform it into a string so, can use it, uh, so you can use it in your application code. Right? You don't know actually what the, 
um, what the content of the file is, but you simply try to, to convert it into a string using a, a certain char set, and then you can deal with it um, not having to deal with a file input stream or something. Yeah, of course, that's only possible if you have these in-memory file, uh, in-memory uh, pipes, because there you are actually using Java objects. Whatever you want, it can be even a file object or whatever. Um, so that wouldn't be possible if you were using JMS at that uh, point. Yeah. Then we have this the string. Router, no, the router. Um, yeah. We have an implementation of the router which actually uh, picks the CSV uh, headers mapping from above. Uh, you know, we defined the, the CSV headers as a map via configuration, and it simply picks it here and says, well, um, the message you, you get, split it, um, uh, uh, split, the, uh, split the line endings, and then check whether. Um, whether the heading, the first line, matches uh, this expression, meaning the, the value you see here. Right, so um, if the value of the, of the first line of the file, where actually the CSV header is placed, uh, matches the CSV header for services, go send the message to the service imports channel. If it matches the CSV headers uh, for pickings, go send it to the picking import channel. If it doesn't match anything, go send it to the unresolvable AVR input channel. That's basically all. And um, if you ask me, it's I think it's really understandable. You can ex extend it whatever for whatever CSV header or whatever um, you get into there. Um, so you can you are really flexible in what your uh, infrastructure logic and integration logic um, really does. Yeah. Um, the question is uh, whether uh, we differentiate here, or the, the mediation framework differentiates uh, between unknown file uh, format or a real error, like um, this is something we can't at all deal with, uh, like um, when the, right, like uh, when you, uh, when you trans try to transform it into a string and just blows up, right. Um, every mediation framework I know has a, a certain error channel. That is a channel where messages get sent if they blow up, if they just don't get through the, uh, through the route you, you define for them. And the Spring integration has an error channel which you can adopt and then sort out uh, what kind of error happened there. You can uh, send it to a, a JMS queue to uh, have another system look at it, whatever you like. There's one error channel, but uh, you can have a different, uh, a different adoption from there. So yeah. you you just have to um, have to configure it like uh, you get the, the the messages from the error channel and then um, route them to whatever you like. Yeah. So you can even have a look here. Um, we have it right there. The um, the unre unresolvable ABR input channel is right here. We add an interceptor so that we do some something additional. We want to um, um, invoke some some uh, custom logic. Right now we are only logging it, and then here we are just um, routing it um, back to the error channel, so that the general error uh, handling occurs after that. Right. Um, this is another. Uh, this is actually another uh, implementation, um, which is which is quite common. The interceptors. Every channel can have an interceptor. And you can do whatever you like. You can uh, route it to a logging. You can uh, say, well, um, I need to get a, a certain information out and send it to system B or whatever. So um, if something goes outside, let's say, in a separate thread, you choose the interceptor. OK, yeah, then uh, let's go back to the, to the splitter stuff. Yeah? 
I mean, this works fine for single instance. Yeah. What if in my production system I have the same app running on multiple instances and you know, multiple, multiple machines with the same cluster? So if I have an inbounding message drop there, they're all going to look at the same place. And then, uh, how, how do you prevent the things processing the same message? Okay, so the question is, um, how do we um, handle this if we have not one instance of the application running, but multiple within a cluster? So how do we prevent uh, the, um, uh, the message from being processed multiple times? Well, the answer is that uh, in this case, you will use um, JMS at one in, uh, of these uh, pipes usually right in front, then you will have one instance that actually watches the input directory and that uses a JMS channel um, and a JMS queue uh, as its first pipe and then you're transactionally safe and um, then you can have as many instances as you want to just watch the JMS queue and uh, you get all the uh, properties of JMS that they are only delivered once. Yeah, but that's yeah. The, we've seen this, and um, usually we uh, the first step to do is just put it from an unreliable input source into JMS. So we also do this with HTTP. You have one endpoint may, that may even run in a cluster, but the first thing we do is put it into JMS so that we are safe. And if we receive a file, put it in JMS, then you're safe. Um, actually, um, the thing is, the, the, the file system uh, integration we did with these um, with a logistic service provider, if you remember the chart, um, there was a business partner system sending data via FTP and just uh, putting it down in some directory, and that's actually what we implemented there. Okay. Um, so um, here's the scenario again. So um, actually, behind the FTP server is a small instance of an application which just reads the the files from uh, from the file system and put it uh, put it uh, puts them um, into a JMS channel. Right. Actually, um, if you have a transactional storage system, you could do the same. Right. It just depends on the transaction. Yeah. So if you have a look at the uh, real life scenario within the cloud, then we see that this can mostly also run in the cloud. But we have a few gotchas that we have to um, uh, that we have to take care of, and that may be one of the um, instances where it's. Uh, Actually, much easier if you're running your own um, EAI stack based on a framework and the patterns compared to an ESB because that would be uh, quite uh, heavy to just put it into the cloud. So um, if you have a look at our application again, and then we see um, a, a number of things that we must take care of in the cloud. We have to adopt for the specific environment there. Um, so we have a limited number of I.O. Uh, gateways. Uh, usually you can't use the file system as a reliable um, uh, the source of input. Well, you shouldn't do in, in a normal enterprise application, but often that's how it works. Um, but in the cloud, there often is no file system that you can rely on. Um, most ports are closed, so um, usually you will have to resort to <coughs> HTTP or uh, something like that in um, uh, to accept data and to, to output data. Um, and you need um, usually um, specific endpoints for the services that are provided as part of the cloud infrastructure. So there might not be a JMS implementation, but if you take uh, Amazon, then you have a simple queuing service or something like that that you can uh, rely on. Um, but that's something 
you can easily add to the framework or most of the things for at least for the common uh, cloud providers are already there. So you have um, input and output, inbound and outbound adapters for um, simple queuing service and for S3 and all those uh, things that you will find in a common cloud. So the message is, is really clear. Sometimes it's hard to integrate legacy systems into the cloud, but it's doable with enterprise application integration. And um, that's actually what, what we uh, wanted to, to send you uh, as a message, um, because sometimes it seems hard to have a, an application uh, depending on FTP or something like this. But if you really focus on decoupling and, and uh, slicing the steps really needed, you can just say, well, uh, these two steps I'm doing before the cloud, and then everything else goes into the cloud. And if you, and if you go back to our sample here, actually, Except for the FTP server thing, the green box is running in the cloud. So um, the, last, uh, the last advice we need to give you, um, keep an eye on traffic and network I.O. If you sync, uh, sync between your applications, this is uh, really a serious issue in our eyes. OK, time for Q&A. So feel free to ask questions. Yes, please. Um, currently, I don't know. Repeat the question. What? Repeat the question. Ah, sorry. Um, uh, the, the question was um, if there are any good adapt. What? Any yeah, decent patterns for um, uh, the, the, the adaption of what kind of application? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I don't know of a pattern uh, to do these kind of calls right now. But actually, is it doable? Any further questions? How can we get access to the presentation? Sorry? How do we get access to this presentation? Yeah. Um, just have a look at the GitHub. Right. We have a QR code for you. Um, so um, the thing is, if you like what you saw, just follow us on Twitter, please. Um, if you didn't like, give us the chance to get better and provide feedback, e.g. via uh, GitHub issues. Can you get the sample for It's also on GitHub. Yeah. So awesome. everything you need is on GitHub at this URL. So just get the, get the QR code going and you're there. Okay. So thank you.